Welcome to our guest from Mississippi. Glad to have you. Students, I'm so glad that y'all came. I think this is going to be uh, a wonderful 45 minutes to an hour. Um, my name is Christy Holt. I'm the Title IV-E coordinator here, and so my whole area of work and my career has been in the area of child welfare. Um, worked in the department for 21 years before I came here, and so my heart and my passion is still around the area of child welfare, developing students that want to do this kind of work, supporting those that are already in the field, and, and stories that made the work worthwhile. And so really that's what Judge Coker's going to talk about today is kind of what he's experienced from the perspective of a judge. And so, uh, Judge, I'm going to turn it over to you and get out of the way. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon and roll tide. I'm a uh, 1996 graduate of the university, 1999 graduate of the University of Alabama School of Law, so I'm Alabama through and through. Um, I'll tell you very briefly what the role of a district judge in Calvert County entails. It entails me being in, uh, over and responsible for over uh, seven divisions. I handle all the traffic cases in my county. I handle uh, all the district criminal cases, the small claims cases, the district civil cases, the child support cases, the juvenile delinquents, and the juvenile dependency cases. Of the 8,000 cases that I handle a year, there's only one district judge. Um, 399 of those cases last year were juvenile dependency cases. That only amounts to 5% of my caseload, but it um, amounts to 95% of my worry. And so um, through that, um, at times I know uh, it can be a thankless job when you're out there on the front line, especially for those workers. Uh, many times their efforts are not uh, acknowledged uh, and respected and well received but um, really if you want to know the, the heartbeat of this country and, and where we're headed ask a social worker and uh, she can tell you for the most part but I want to talk to you a little bit about a personal story that I had uh, in, in my journey uh, and um, give you a little better glimpse in my world as a judge and um, I've been on my job now for nine years I worked hard for the job. I had to campaign for the job. I spent way too much money um, and uh, 18 months of my life knocking on doors and hoping that I would win. But all that time, uh, never did I pray that I would win. I always prayed that it would be God's will, uh, that God would give me the ability uh, to fulfill the promises that I had made, the, that I was qualified to do the job that I was running for, and if I fell short, that he would give me the courage um, and the direction to choose the other path that he had for me. And so I told myself, and I had continued to tell myself, maybe he sent me to save one child. Uh, maybe he sent me to find that one precious soul in his kingdom and to do right by him or her. And after that time, my work would be done, and he would move me on to something else. And so I've always held to that thought. On July the 1st, 2017, a baby boy named William was born. William was born to two parents who were illegals. Uh, they had traveled to this country from Guatemala, and uh, really, they were children themselves. Uh, but they had come here just in the hope and a dream of having a better life. And um, at the time William was born, he was born with a host of medical issues. His brain did not fully develop. His body could not produce the requisite hormones he needed to survive. Um, he had hydrocephalus, and in the words of the doctors, he was just born unlucky. For months, he lingered at Children's Hospital. Over the course of the first year of his life, William spent a total of 12 days in his home. I had no idea this child existed. In May of 20. Um, in, in May of 2018, uh, the uh, Department of Human Resources assisted the mother who could not speak English, who did not have a driver's license, who had no means of transportation in finding a facility for her child. Uh, Father Purcells outside of Montgomery is a pediatric nursing home, and he was placed there with the assistance of my department. 
in May um, of that year. After he was placed there, he was promptly forgotten. His mother and father had become estranged from each other and neither visited. My department stopped checking on him, stopped seeing him because he wasn't technically in their care. And so from there, at Father Purcell's, he had four different visits to Children's Hospital. Four times this child was transported by himself in an ambulance to Children's Hospital. On the fourth admission, Children's Hospital made an abandoned child report to the City of Sheffield, their police department, who followed up with it, contacted my local DHR, the Child Abuse and Neglect Unit. They went out and investigated, could not find the parents, knew we had a child in medical need, and so they properly filed their petition. On August the 31st, I heard his case. I had sorrow for his soul. I knew he was terminal. It was a quick hearing. We had um, the DHR caseworker, the DHR attorney, and the guardian at life. The hearing did not take long at all. Um, but, you know, as, I, as much as I hated it, life had to move on. You see, football season started uh, the following day. And um, Alabama was kicking off, and they were not playing here in Tuscaloosa, but I was coming to Tuscaloosa to spend the weekend with some friends. I was going to have some fun. I was going to watch the game. Monday was Labor Day. It's going to be a holiday. So a state worker, I don't have to work. And so I had priorities, and those priorities were important to me. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. On the outside, I think I pretty much have it together. But I'm human. On the inside, not so much. I've got problems. I have a mortgage. So that's why maybe on that Saturday morning, September 1st, I'm up at 3 a.m., I'm up at the gym, I'm going to do something, I'm going to plan my day, I come home and I'm going to get my shower and I'm going to figure out what time I'm headed to Tuscaloosa. And so, um, as I do my best thinking, you know, in the shower, and, and, and best singing, by the way, as well, um, I decided that, um, I thought about William, and I said, okay, I've got a child that's terminal, um, that's going to pass away. I don't know um, what I can do for him, but I know he's going to have to have a funeral. I assume he's Catholic. I don't know if he's been baptized or not. We've got to have some songs. What can those songs be? I'm sort of, sort of a control freak when it comes to my kids, and my foster kids are my kids. And so I started thinking about those things. I thought, well, I can't do anything about William right now, but at least I can plan. I can plan a, a funeral. So what songs can be sung? I'd only attended one child's funeral before. It's when I was in college here at First Methodist Church in, in Tuscaloosa. And I remember that song and I played it. And I thought, it just doesn't sound right uh, for this situation. But the great thing about YouTube is underneath it, it'll make other suggestions for you. And then there was the song, Here I Am, Lord, which I had heard. And, uh, but I decided, well, I'll play this until I can get to the point that I can find a better song for Wiggle. And the lyrics started... I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars and night, I will make the darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Well, about that time, I started crying. I thought, you're not talking to me. This is not a situation, um, you know, yeah, I, I may, I'm in dwelling in that darkness. I understand it. Um, and I know William's there too, but whom shall I send? Is it I? Mm -hmm. So I make that great deal that we always do. God, I'm going to play this song again. <laughs> and if I cry again, then we'll talk, you know. So about the fourth or fifth time I'm playing it and I'm sobbing, I just decide I've got to give up. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So that became my responsibility that morning. I got ready. I drove on down to Children's Hospital. I had never been there before. I found my way in. And being a judge in this state, it has a lot of perks. People, it can open some doors for you. It can help 
on the side of the interstate, so I've heard. Um, it will not help you with a 20-year-old, I'm sure she's sweet, student at UAB that's working as the receptionist at Children's Hospital. You see, William had four names, and I was going with William's last name, and his last name was under a couple of names. And she could not find his name. And I was then concerned he had already passed away, and I didn't get to him. And so um, we had some little tense conversations, and me trying to exert my will uh, as a judge, and she exerting her will as HIPAA, my mandate. And um, finally, I had made a friend and called him a DHR supervisor. He said, try this name. And we tried it. I got in, got my badge. I was on the elevator. I was headed to William. I got up on the floor and I didn't know what I would find. I'm a bit squeamish. I don't want blood. I don't want guts. I don't want fluids. I don't want tubes. I don't like anything to be out of the ordinary. I don't like anything to be abnormal. But as I entered his room, I found William lying there. He was simply a child, a very, very sick soul. So I didn't know what to do. So I stood beside William and I went up to standing beside William that day for three hours. I stroked his head. The top of his head had the indention that almost made the top of a heart. Um, it was sweet. It was sad. I sang to him. I'm not a singer. I prayed over him. I didn't really know any of his needs, but I knew at that very moment, at that very time, 90 days removed, he needed a father's touch. And as I stood there, I noticed the nurses stopping. And I had introduced myself to the nurse when I first went in, and she said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Chad Poker, and I'm his judge. That was just the easiest thing to say. And so other nurses would stop by, who is that? His judge. I, I felt like I was some type of, you know, lecherous old man or something. I just didn't feel comfortable being in there. But then the doctors came by, and the doctors did not even enter the room on their rounds. They peered in, they looked, they all stayed out there. And then it hit me as I was standing there, as they walked away. For 90 days, no one had come to see this child. No one from the outside world had cared. But at that very moment, I did. I loved him because of the calling that I had just received five hours before. I loved him because in that very moment, in that very room, it was just William and me, just two souls trying to find their way home. And so I left that day knowing that I would return. I came on to Tuscaloosa. I got up early the next morning. He didn't have a stuffed animal. I wanted him to have something in his crib, so I purchased him a bear. He didn't have a voice. And so I knew that when I left that day, it was important for William to somehow as best he could to have a connection for the nurses and staff to know his story. And so I drew a picture for him and I wrote a note and I placed it above his bed. William had a story to tell. He wanted to be loved. I wanted these nurses to love him as well. I needed them to connect to him and to his struggle. And so this is what I wrote out for William. Hello, my name is William, and I'm a pretty big deal. I'm only one, and I get lots of attention. I'm a big hit with the ladies. I already have three girlfriends, Brittany, who is my judicial assistant, Bethany, who is his guardian Latin, and Shadell, who is his caseworker. I think some nurses like me, too. I pretty much just hang out here. I don't say much. I, I really just like to listen. So talk to me. Tell me some stories. Maybe even secrets. I won't tell. Stroke my hair. Sing to me. And say sweet things about how handsome I am. I'm real easy on my eyes. Thank you for stopping by. For loving me. And for hopefully stealing a kiss from me too. I love those kisses. William. I said goodbye to William that day. And I told the nurse on my way out. I'll see you tomorrow. 
And so I headed on home. It's about a two hour drive for me to get back to, from, from Birmingham back into Muscle Shoals. And when I got home, I called Karen Smith, who's a deputy commissioner of state DHR. Karen and I were colleagues. We were not friends. I had met her at some meetings. She had made the wise decision of providing me her cell number. And so that night, on a Sunday before state holiday, I call her and she answers, hello, judge. And I said, hey, Karen, and I explained to her about William. And I got to a point and I said to Karen, I said, hear me, he will not die alone. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Yes, judge, we will figure out something to do. Well, Labor Day was the next day. And for most of y'all, Labor Day is great. It's a time to hit the lake. It's a time to go shopping. It's a time to do some fun things. For a politician in Culver County, Labor Day is a whole new undertaking. It starts with a Labor Day breakfast at six or seven in the morning. You go to a Labor Day parade, which is hot. You go down to Spring Park to a candidate speaking and you hear all these people talk. And then you drive 45 minutes almost to the Mississippi line uh, down winding roads to Coon Dog Cemetery, where you can have barbecue and other um, political events uh, down that way. Every year I had done that. This time it wasn't important. What was important was for me to go back to see William. And when I went back, I got outside his room and I could hear something different. Guess what? The TV was on. A movie was playing. Someone from the hospital had, had brought by a little teddy bear that made the heart sound of a heartbeat. It was in his crib. They knew that I was watching. They knew that I was coming back. They knew that he mattered to someone and they knew that William mattered to me. And when I went into the room, this is the face that greeted me that morning. DHR began their round-the-clock care. They all had to take shifts if you were a foster care worker or if you were a supervisor. Supervisors took 12-hour shifts, foster care workers took eight-hour shifts. I took my own share of shifts. If I didn't quite trust that foster care worker going down there, guess what? My schedule would open up and I could take her shift too. And so I rearranged some shifts um, and then volunteered for some shifts to, to, so I could be there with him. Williams Guardian Lightning came. The parents attorney came down to see him through the efforts of our local DHR. And um, with the, the help of the attorneys, they found the parents. At first, we had thought that they had abandoned him in neighbor Nashville. We found them working in two different Mexican restaurants in our area. They had become estranged. Um, and there had been some domestic disharmony. But through the efforts of the attorneys and DHR, we were at least able to get the parents to come back down there. The mom got to see him. The dad got to kiss him. They got to touch him again. And um, I was down there while the dad was visiting and they called in the priest and I was, got to witness him being baptized with his dad um, right there by him. As I was down there and it, it didn't seem like we had a plan for William. Each time he had come to Children's, he would be released. Uh, each time he was placed on the vent, he would be taken off. And each time he returned, he was weaker. The decision had to be made to remove him from the vent. The hospital was waiting on DHR to sort of talk to them about that. DHR was waiting on the hospital to sort of talk to them about that. I happened to be there at the right time in the right place, and I said, okay, listen up, Doc. If y'all need something signed, I'll sign it. But we've got to make a decision of what we're going to do. And luckily, they were able to get the parents back in there. Everybody agreed that we would be taken off the bed. We had no idea how long he would make it. Would he make it four minutes, four hours, four days? No one could tell me. And so I, you know, I asked everybody, but they're not going to tell you those questions. 
the day before he was to be taken off the bed, they called in the life specialist, who has a great time at Children's Hospital, and she gets to play games with some of these kids that have been there and confined, and she gets to pick them up ice cream and those things, but she also has to prepare those parents for their child's transition. She came in, and she proceeded to make handprints and footprints for William, for his parents to have, um, depending on what happened the following day. The following day, he was removed from the bed. It was my longest day uh, that I had on the bench. His parents were in attendance. I had a full dock and I couldn't make it. I was going down there that evening. The hospital staff, the DHR staff, uh, they kept me informed. I knew that he had been successfully removed. He was breathing on his own. And so I raced through my afternoon docket. I had my bag packed and my truck ready to roll. And I was gonna get to William because I was gonna get to hold him for the first time. His supervisor was also on her way down there. It was a race. I am a judge. I won. <laughs> So I got there and I got to hold William for the first time. Uh, Tanya uh, held him not too long after I held him. And it got to be about nine o'clock. I said, Tanya, you going home. I'm gonna stay with William, you know, tonight. No judge, you can go on home. I'm gonna stay with William tonight. So it was my first and only time to spend the night with the DHR worker. Um, <laughs> I gave her the couch. I took the recliner. But over the course of the next days, I, I, would, I, would, I would go down as often as I could. There were hard days. There were harder nights. It seemed as though at 3 a.m., it was the hour when everything just fell apart. He would cry. His numbers would drop. His temperature would be all over the board. It was some of the toughest times that he would have. I would call the shift changes to find out, at, at times of shift change, to find out what his vitals were, what his numbers were. The nurses knew I would, I would be calling. You know, he was just important to me, and I had to know. Um, but as hard as those days were, I knew that the day was approaching. He was off the bed. The hospital was going to ready themselves to discharge him, and that was going to be difficult. Where would he go? Would they be good to him? You see, he was special to me at that time. I mean, I had made him an Alabama fan, so he was part of the family here. And so, again, uh, the Department of Human Resources, my local, uh, through the state, found William a place. This lady had, had terminally ill children in her home. By all accounts, I'm sure um, she would be great and wonderful. She just lived in Union Springs, which if you know anything about Alabama, that's too far away from Carver County. It's about four hours away. So you know what? I, I, I called and I said, I called the sweet Karen Smith. Actually, I sent her a text that night. And I said, this is not fair to these parents. They cannot drive to see him. This is not fair to this young 23-year-old foster care worker that's gonna to have to drive to see him. What I really wanted to say to her is this is not fair to me because at this point he was mine. And I said, you're not gonna place him there, although I had no authority. Uh, but I said, you know, you, we've got to find something closer. Judge, we'll try. We will try our best. And I said, we'll try harder. And um, it was just probably one of the lowest points that I had had because I thought, okay, we've stabilized him and now he's gonna be sent farther off. And so my DHR director had sent out an email to surrounding counties and their directors. But when I arrived at the hospital that night about nine o'clock, I texted my judge friends in the, in the surrounding counties. And I said to them, send me your DHR director's name and number. And so I started getting my text in. At nine o'clock, I started calling DHR directors. 
I called the one and, and I either talked to them or left a message. I called Madison County, Limestone County, Lauderdale County, Barnes County, Franklin County, Winston County, Marion, Lamar, Walker. I called them all. Some answered, some didn't. If it was a female that answered, you better believe after I got that phone, I texted that picture of William to her and trying to make a connection, trying to find somebody that would heed my call. Well, it worked. The next day, the Winston County director contacted our local director and said, hey, we have a potential placement. She actually lives right in Franklin County, uh, just five minutes though outside of Haywood, that's in Winston County. She's one of our foster parents. She's a hospice nurse. She was, she's planning on closing her home, but for some reason, she's left it open. I've talked to her, she's willing to consider it. And so Stephanie was her name. I found out all the information. I did a best background check that the CIA could not have even accomplished what I did. The only had speeding tickets, so she was pretty legit. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that he was going someplace where he was gonna be okay. I arrived at the hospital that day, and one of the most difficult scenes for me was when I walked in and there was a new item in the room. This awaited me, and I knew that he was about to be removed from the home that he had known, really the only home that he had known. I knew he was going home, but it wasn't my home. How would they love him? Could they love him? Would they be good to him? Would they be kind to him? Would they meet his needs? You've got to throw caution to the wind sometimes in this job. The hospital staff readied themselves to say goodbye to William. He had become attached. They had become attached to him. And Stephanie arrived for a day and a half of training. And then she would be taking him home to her husband and sons. And she did. And William went home that night to the first crib that he had ever known. I began to breathe easier. I got a chance to visit. He was only 45 minutes away. He was loved. I knew that he was loved. Uh, we kept in touch. She would send me text messages. She would send me pictures. William had spent his time at Children's. We knew his time might be short. <coughs> so Stephanie arranged through a friend to have Santa come and see him uh, in late September to have Santa pray over him. And Stephanie fell in love with William. Her husband fell in love with William. He was their son, he was their brother. William, in a sense, during that time, um, he thrived. Uh, I had an opportunity to take my daughter down to see him. She finally got to hold the child that she had been drawing cards and, and things for. William rested. He even got a haircut and um, he was theirs. I, his progress though was short lived. We knew it might be. His disposition rate, his saturation rate, they had started to decline. I was visiting on a Sunday when uh, a hospice nurse that the Department of Human Resources had, had hired uh, was there. Stephanie had wanted them to come down and check on William, and so I was there when she arrived. And she looked at William, and she listened to William, and, and she looked at Stephanie, and Stephanie said, how long? And she said, maybe two weeks. And so I watched Stephanie, a hospice nurse herself, who had said goodbye to way too many people, crumble before my eyes. And all I could do was stand there and hold her, and hug her. And so, um, on that day, I knew that my time would be short. So I held him as much as I could. I stayed with him a few more hours that day. Um, his lungs were filling up. You could hear um, that. You could see that. His numbers were deteriorating. It would be soon. On October the 25th, I planned to go back and see him that day. 
Uh, at noon, I was going to take off the rest of the afternoon. I was going to see him and stay with him that afternoon. And I was up walking, and at 4 a.m., my phone rang. And it was Stephanie. And she told me, she said, William has died. I told her, I said, I'll be there in an hour. And as I entered the room, she was sitting there rocking him. The DHR supervisor was there, his caseworker, hospice individuals, Stephanie's mother. And as I entered the room, stepping in the middle of the room with William, she looked up at me and she said, I've been holding him for you. It's time for you to rock him too. And there I sat, looking at this child of God, patting him on his body, hoping that he ran to that line to get that puppy that I promised was waiting for him on the other side. I told him of the secrets. I, I thought of the secrets that I had told him, the hopes and dreams of mine that I couldn't share with anybody else. But William was there. He listened. He cared. He did not tell. And as I looked around that room, our party of two had grown to a party of eight. I accompanied the foster parents to the funeral home because the parents were going to be there. DHR would be there. I was going to be there to help plan the funeral. The funeral home had informed the priest that the family was Hispanic. The priest was bilingual. He was going to attempt to do uh, the service in Spanish for them. And he did. But the parents were estranged. We had two different interpreters <laughs> that were there on the front row with each parent. And as the priest did not really know William, he stumbled a little bit. And so, doing what I do, I got up, excused myself from the service, went to the funeral home director, and said to him, Mike, this isn't working for me, and I'm going to go say something um, once this guy gets through. Yes, Judge, we will hold the music. Do what you need to do. And so I did. And I went there and I talked. So many people had impacted William's life. While his mother and father were there, they had not been there through the end of this journey. There were people that had driven an hour. The first person through the line at his visitation, it was Santa. Santa, who did not know Stephanie, but just had met William, had held William, had fallen in love with William like the rest of us. And as I talked about my time with William, what he meant to me, and what the foster parents had meant to William, I counted our party of two having grown to party eight, had 36 people there. William's simple soul had impacted so many lives and so many that had come through the line that had not stayed for the funeral. From the time I began his case, and at many times in between, I was angry. Angry as I felt my department had failed William for that 90 days where he was left alone. But had it not been for that failing, I never would have had this blessing. From September 1st to October the 25th, I fought for him, for his soul, for his care, from the time I met him until the day I buried him. I did as much as I could do for him. I didn't do what my job required of me, I did what my faith and my soul commanded of me. In speaking of his story, I only ask that you consider doing the same. In the end, every one of you in this room has a week, someone that is crying, that needs your help, your answer, your time, your prayers, your love, your touch. Find that person, heed that call, make it your mission. Give them a voice, give them hope, give to them. 
as I look back over my life, my two short months with him, I'm content I did right by him. His 15-month journey changed my 45-year-old trajectory. And as I came to hopefully save William, I know there are others at times that will come to save me. You see, all those times I reached for his hand, I realize now I wasn't holding his, but he, through William, was holding mine. In William and in him, I find peace. In William and in him, I find answers. In William and in him, I find love. And in William and in him, I find God's grace, the very grace that I need to survive. I don't know what my future holds, but I know my prayer of nine years ago was answered. When my life is complete for two small months, two very short months, I walked this earth, I listened, I loved, and I carried forward with will, God's will. And for that, I have been blessed. Thank you very much. greatest concern that foster parents have they're signing on to, to love this child and to lose this child they want to know they're going to be supported they're going to want to know that the department's going to be there they're going to want to know that if there, there's the need for respite care if there's the, the need for just three hours one day they need to get out that someone's going to be there because they're giving up their life for this child's life and, you know, I think that that's important. I think there's some power in always uh, refusing to uh, accept the answer no. <laughs> and just, just at times, just be stubborn. And there's always a way to go around certain things. Uh, but I think if we build trust with foster parents and, and, and we know and we can, we can build upon uh, those foster parents who have served in that role, talking and mentoring these others, I think we can open that up. You know, Father Purcell's would be the last place. I didn't know Father Purcell's existed. But you know what? There are very few pediatric nursing homes in this country. And, you know, we have an option of one here. That's the last place I want to put a child. The primary characteristic you needed in that worker. This is a hard case. This is not a typical case. We've got 18 others that we're trying to, to work with, but what, what, what's the one characteristic you would like to see us try to develop in these young workers? Compassion. I mean, in the end, I mean, if you just have compassion uh, for these kids, and at times, compassion for these parents, that can be very hard, but Oftentimes, and we discussed, in the end, when you don't know what to do with the child, and I've been that place, that, that spot with, with my own daughter, because sometimes you don't have to, you don't have time to go to that big book that says what to expect when you're expecting and all these things. And you look at this child that's screaming and yelling and what I do, you think, what would my mama do? And that's what some of these parents do. What would my mama do? Guess what? Mama did it wrong 20 years ago, and they're going to do it wrong today. It's not coming out of ill will. They don't want to physically hurt that child. Rarely do I ever see that. I never see that really from a mom. They make poor decisions. They don't want to hurt that child, but they just don't know. And so sometimes as, as the frontline worker, it's hard. It's hard to, to go into a situation where you have a mom or dad that are hostile. But you know what? You want them to be mad. You want them to be angry. Because if they are, guess what? That child matters in some capacity to them. Where you ought to be concerned is when you have that mom that has no anger, that can care less. That's where I'm concerned. That's the child that 
potentially be harm if returned. But you want that here. You need to look at it from that perspective. You've taken something that's precious to them. Yeah, they ought to be mad. I'd be mad too. And um, and then work through that. And once you build, once they see that you have compassion, and once you build trust, and once they see that you're there to help them, things can change. And that dynamic 